Perhaps you've never been told how much your life is worth and that you really don't have much to offer. But you do. You only have to open up the treasure that God has for your life. God's shining grace can find you in the shadows. There is hope for you and me, and there is hope for the worst sinner. How have you explained this to lost sinners? Welcome back. This is part two of Hope for the Worst Sinner. The Bible tells me that God's grace is greater than all of our sin if we come to Christ. Now, I I should clarify something from the first part. I was talking about justification. And I told you what the Bible teaches, that the word justify means to declare righteous. It doesn't mean to make righteous as taught by our beloved friends in the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent. Now, let me read you a text. I quoted it, but I I don't think I I made it real plain in the first part. Uh, Here it is, Luke chapter 7 and verse 29. Here we go. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. It says, these people, the tax collectors, justified God. Well, they didn't make God righteous, did they? Of course not. You can't make God righteous. They declared God righteous. When God justifies the sinner, he declares him righteous on the basis of Christ's death for his sins. This is, this is the gospel. This is the most amazing truth in the whole of the Bible. It's something, my friend, to get excited about. How have I tried to explain this to people around the world? Well, I'm sure very inadequately. But I remember when we were running the campaign in the city of Kiev, we saw the glory of God. I just want to say before we go any further today, anything that I have been involved in, it has been through the grace of God. It wasn't my doing. It was the doing of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God. I could do nothing. But when we went to the city of Kiev, we had tremendous crowds. For the opening of the meetings, we had 100,000 people outside trying to get in. Amazing. How can you... How can you explain this? This was the power of the Holy Spirit working on very hungry hearts. We had people coming from Chernobyl. We all know about Chernobyl, about the terrible nuclear meltdown in Chernobyl. We had busloads of people coming from Chernobyl, people who had lived with death. What was I going to say to these people? What was I going to tell these thousands and thousands of people who were packing out the biggest auditorium in that part of the world? I told them, firstly, God loves you. You're not an animal. You're not a machine. You're a child of God. God made you. You are special. You're so special that Christ died for you. That's what I want to say to you, my friend, today. You're special. God loves you. Christ died for you. And if you turn to Christ, this is what I told the people from Chernobyl and the people in Kiev. I said, if you come to Christ, Christ will accept you. Behold this Christ hanging on the cross for you. He died for you. And we saw thousands and thousands of people come to Christ. And when they came to Christ, they became new creatures in Christ. God justified them. He declared that they were righteous and then he started a work in their hearts to change their lives. We saw the power and the grace of God. 
Isn't this what some people call cheap grace? No, no, we're not talking about cheap grace. We're talking about very expensive grace. This grace is so expensive, it costs the life of the Son of God. There was no other way. People say, well, why did Christ have to go to the cross? Because Christ took our place, my friend. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is not cheap grace. This is grace that brought God down from his throne in heaven in the person of Christ and put him on the Roman cross. Now, what is cheap grace? Cheap grace is Christ without the cross. It is forgiveness without repentance. There's plenty of this around today. There's plenty of cheap grace, but you're not hearing cheap grace today. We're talking about very expensive grace. Have you heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? He was that famous German theologian, just a young man who stood out against Hitler. He had a safe passage in the great city of London. He could have stayed there, lived out the time when the war was going. He didn't have to go back to Germany, but he said, I've got to go back to my people. Bonhoeffer believed in expensive grace. He went back to his people. He went back and he preached the truths of the Bible. He opposed Hitler. He was put to death. He died because he didn't practice cheap grace. He practiced expensive grace. This is the grace we're talking about today, the grace of God which is greater than all of our sin. Are there some people so righteous that they don't need to repent? <laughs> uh, Wayne, that's, that's sort of funny. Are there some people who are so righteous that they don't need to repent? <laughs> uh, there are some people who think they are. You've met them. And I've met them too. They're, they're super, super religious. They are spiritual icebergs. They're freezing cold and they, they will drive more people out of a church than the greatest evangelist with the grace of God can bring into that church. Spiritual icebergs, self-righteous Pharisees. Now, are there some people who don't need to repent? Let me read you a text. Luke chapter 15 and verses 1, 2 and 7. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. The sinners loved Jesus. The religious people on the whole hated Jesus. Is there a message here? I wonder. The verse goes on to say, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, always moaning and complaining were the Pharisees. They complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus said, <laughs> you're right. You're wrong in everything, but you're right on this. I do receive sinners and I do eat with them. Then Jesus said in the parable, I say to you that likewise there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Who was Jesus talking about? He was talking about the Pharisees, these super self-righteous religious people who had no need of repentance. They had no need of repentance because they felt that they were sinless. Have you met people like this? I guess we all have. People who are so cold and so frigid and so self-righteous that they have no need of repentance. But my friend, 
The gospel of Christ is even for self-righteous people. And the gospel will save any person who comes to Christ in repentance. This is the good news of God, that the gospel will save any person who comes to Christ in sincere repentance. Let me tell you about a Pharisee who will be in the kingdom of God. Paul, the apostle who wrote most of the New Testament and the greatest book in the New Testament, some scholars say, that's the book of Romans, which is the book about righteousness through faith. So there's hope for every person who sees his sin and comes in repentance to Christ. Who are some of the most wicked men and women in the Bible who received grace and forgiveness? Well, Wayne, my old friend, that's a tough question because there are many, many wicked people in the Bible. There are many good people too, but there are many, many wicked people. I don't know if I would want to have a competition as to who was the most wicked person, but let me give you some suggestions. Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, who was responsible for the blood of Christ. Can you think of a more wicked person? There was Judas, one of the 12 disciples, who betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. There was Herod, Herod this petty little king, Herodias, whose hands were dripping blood, the blood of John the Baptist. What a dreadful person. What dreadful people these are. Belshazzar, this great blasphemer who was described in the book of Daniel, Jezebel, Nimrod, and other villains. Now, to the best of my knowledge, I do not know of any record that gives us any, any reason to believe that they repented. It is a terrible thing, my friend, to greatly sin against God and then to sin against the Holy Spirit and to commit the unpardonable sin. And so there have been some dreadful people who are mentioned in the Bible. The next thing they will know, I believe, will be the resurrection and the judgment of God. Jesus said to those priests who were standing before him, he said, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven and then you will see and you will recognize that I am the Christ. Book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, and as it is appointed for men to die once and after this, the judgment, and then it says, 1031, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think it was Jefferson who said, I tremble for my country when I realize that God is just and justice cannot sleep forever. There is a judgment day, my friend, and therefore we need to come to Christ and we need to come to Christ now. Do you have one or two people that stand out who found grace and mercy? The most wicked person who found grace and mercy? Well, there are a number of wicked people in the Bible who found grace and mercy. Any person outside of Christ, as far as the law of God is concerned, is a wicked person. But I imagine you're talking about high-handed people Wicked sinners. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was a great boaster, wasn't he? Is not this great Babylon that I have built for my great glory? And then he went crazy for seven years. But the Bible tells us he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And you can read in Daniel, I'm not going to take time to read it now, but Daniel chapter 4, 34 to 37, you can read the amazing story 
of Nebuchadnezzar's repentance. Amazing. The last words about Nebuchadnezzar are words where he is praising God and he is saying, I now worship the most high God. I give him glory and honour. I think Nebuchadnezzar found salvation. This great sinner. But he found salvation because of a great saviour. I think perhaps the greatest sinner in the Bible, now of course I could be wrong, I'm often wrong you know, 1 Kings chapter, let me see, 1 Kings 21, here we go, and verse 25 and onwards. Uh, I, think, I think this is probably the greatest sinner in the Bible. There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. <laughs> that must have been his wife's fault. <laughs> I don't think so. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. Goodness, that sounds like repentance. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me because he has humbled himself before me. I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. It appears to me. This old pilgrim that Ahab found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And if there's hope for Ahab, there's hope for anybody. In fact, there's hope for you and there's hope for me and there's hope for everybody because this man receives sinners. There's hope for the very, very worst sinner. And then what what about that, that murderous Pharisee? who went around persecuting people, who participated in in, in the murder of St. Stephen. Do you know whom I'm speaking of? I'm speaking of Saul of Tarsus, that persecuting Pharisee who found grace because grace is greater than all of our sins. Uh, The Apostle Paul called himself the chief of sinners. If there's mercy for Paul and Ahab and Nebuchadnezzar, I'm telling you, friend, there's mercy for you and for me. Glory, hallelujah. Who killed Jesus? I I want to read you a little poem. Love this poem. Marvelous grace of our living Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, that's where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, they, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And this grace, was perfectly displayed when Christ went to the cross. Now here is a profound text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1921. Paul wrote, that is, that God was in Christ. You hear this? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Goodness, so good. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Almost too too much to, to try to explain. All the sin of the world was laid upon Christ. He became our propitiation. He became our our substitute. He did not avenge the anger of an angry judge. 
This was God himself bearing my sin. The sin of Judas, the sin of Caiaphas, the sin of Belshazzar, the sin of Paul, the sin of every man, every woman who has ever lived. All this sin was placed upon him like a huge, filthy, overwhelmingly black, disgusting garment. He died in six hours. Listen, the cross did not kill Christ. He died in six hours. The sin of the world, your sin and my sin killed Christ. He has paid the price. That is why if we believe in him, we shall not perish. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. There is forgiveness and grace for the worst sinner. That's you and me. Can you tell us the story about a wicked boy who whipped his mother? Well, now, Wayne, this is one of my favorite stories. When I was a boy at Avondale College studying theology, I had the privilege of hearing one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. I think one of the greatest preachers of all time. His name was H.M.S. Richards. He came out to college and he preached this great sermon. I was in my last year in theology. I thought I knew everything. (laughs) when in fact I knew nothing. But here came this big preacher from America, this big, tall, lanky man, big arms. I still remember the sermon. The topic was the unsparing God. He went to the text of Peter, God didn't spare the angels that sinned. Why? Because of sin. He didn't spare the people who lived in the days of Noah. No, he didn't spare the people in Sodom. Then he came to Romans chapter 8. He didn't spare his own son. Then he told the story of how he was always, as a little boy, driving his little brother crazy and his mother said to him, Harold, you got to stop this. If you don't stop this, I won't beat you anymore. You'll have to beat me. He told the story of how his mother took him into the bedroom when he would not take any counsel and how his brother was screaming and his mother, his young mother, bared her back and commanded that he beat her. There was this big rod and he tried to lift it up, beat his mother, HMS Richards. And when she saw he could take no more, he was breaking down and weeping. She put her arm around him and told him the story of the cross, how Christ was beaten by the sinner, with the sinner, for the sinner. He said, that's when he came to God. That's when his life was changed. That's when he stopped teasing his brother. That's when he stopped driving the family crazy. When he discovered the truth of Christ. My friend, I want to tell you today, Christ was beaten for you. Christ died for you. He loves you. And if you and I will come to Christ today as penitent sinners, none of us are righteous, if we will come just as we are with all of our sins and all of our complaints and all of our problems, and believe in him, he will accept us. He will justify us. He will declare us righteous. He will write our names down in glory. And then he will change our hearts and he will write his law on our hearts and make us into new people. This is the amazing good news of the gospel. 
the greatest news. There's hope and salvation for the worst sinner. So there's hope for you and there's hope for me. Glory be to God. Because of the current crisis in the Ukraine, spiritual programs have all but vanished. There's an overwhelming hunger for the Word of God. And to respond to this urgent need, the Carter Report has pledged to build a media center. There is a building in a safe part of Ukraine that needs to be finished. Lights, cameras, sound and editing equipment will be purchased and installed. This center will produce Bible studies and church services. Also, radio and Christian TV programs that can be viewed on digital devices. Here are a few of God's soldiers on the battlefield in Ukraine. Dear Pastor Carter and uh, your team, dear friends uh, who support us in this very challenging time for Ukraine, for us it's a big relief, huge encouragement that we can stay here and can dream about future steps in our mission to share gospel of Jesus Christ. We appreciate your prayer support. We appreciate your donations so much. We really dream that here in this place will be a very good uh, studio for Chernovsky, for Ukrainian at all, where we can share the gospel. Please continue to pray about us, about our team, about Ukraine, and we will pray for you. Thank you very much. These people are compelled to move forward in faith. Let us all, in God's grace, move forward with them. We are asking you, supporters of the Carter Report, to help heal the hearts of Ukrainians with the Word of God. Please send your contributions for the Ukrainian Carter Report Media Center to our website or to the address on the screen. They need peace. They need hope. They need the Word of God now. You can now find the Carter Report anywhere, anytime, on any Android or Apple device. Use your cell phone, tablet, computer, or TV to access the many inspirational messages from Pastor Carter 24-7. For Apple users, go to the App Store. For Android users, go to Google Play and download the free Carter Report app. The Carter Report also has an official YouTube and Vimeo channel. Search for The Carter Report and find the topic that speaks to you. Roku users, simply search for The Carter Report and download the app free. The same on Amazon Fire. For Apple TV, visit the App Store and download the app. Reach out to The Carter Report and experience the hope, faith, and love of Jesus Christ. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.